We're talking to uh, Andy from Yokogawa, who's going to uh, talk us through some of their oscilloscope range. Hi, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about scopes, etc., from Yokogawa. I ought to explain a little bit why we have a sumo wrestler sitting on top of the two oscilloscopes. As you might notice from the backdrop uh, behind the scopes, we are in fact celebrating this year our 100th anniversary, our centenary, um, and so we're offering customers a little memento of the event, etc. So yes, here you see two platforms from Yokogawa on our oscilloscopes. We have the DLM 2000 series, which is our portrait style um, oscilloscope. This can be bought in either two or four channel version. And then we move up to the DLM 4000 series, which offers eight channels. Not that we're suggesting everybody needs eight channels, but there are many applications where it's nice to have more than four. And so it's a very good solution, certainly for things like power electronics, mm. when maybe you're looking at things like three phase and you want three voltage, three currents inputs, you'd still have two inputs for knife, knife and fork type work. Looking at both units, uh, the four channel and eight channel units do indeed also offer a logic input. So mm -hmm. on the four channel scope, it is a four analog input or a three analog and eight digital. And on the eight channel scope, it is eight analog or seven analog and eight digital. So that's a phenomenal number of input channels then for your uh, 4000 series scopes. If Absolutely, you and it's, 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 it's a key, key point on the unit. And we can in fact increase that still further by putting in an option for further 16 digital inputs. So now we can offer you an 8 plus 16 MSO or a 7 plus 24. So a lot of input capability in the units. Yeah. Other things that the units will do, we go from 200 megahertz up to 500 megahertz analog band with sampling speeds up to 2.5 giga samples per second, all at very deep memory. We have the capability to go out to up to 250 million data points behind every channel, which again is very key, potentially a lot of electromechanical type applications. And we are talking about this before, and saying you can actually do that full record length at the full sampling speed, I believe. Yeah. And a lot of you sort of uh, compared to some of the lower end scopes, they can do it, but the sampling rate's going to drop. You can do 250 meg samples at 2.5 giga samples per second. Yeah, and that can be key when you want to capture long periods of time and look for fine detail within there. It could be a transient event, a glitch, whatever. You know, there's a long record length to maintain the high sample speed and able to detect that kind of event. And it also means you don't spend half a day trying to work, work out why something's happening only to figure out it's not it's a uh, aliasing artifact. Yeah, so you have to be careful with any DSO about aliasing, etc. But what yeah. I was going to show you today, if that's okay, was just one of the unique capabilities that we have to offer on the DLM 2000 series and indeed the 4000, which is mm. to do with high resolution mode. Um, again, a lot of electromechanical applications, the vertical resolution is quite key. Um, these are both nominally 8-bit digitizers, but when you work to a slower time-based speed, you can put them into different acquisition mode, where they're actually acquiring then up to 13 bits vertical resolution. And then the question comes, it's very nice to have it, but how do we then display 13 bits of resolution on the screen at any point in time? So what we have here today, well, it's very simple. We're looking at literally the calibration signal. So you can see the calibration signal here. We've then got two zoom windows turned on, and that's a unique capability. We have two independent zoom windows. Zoom window one here, and zoom window two here. And then within each zoom window, we've zoomed in also in the vertical domain. And so now we have the vertical and horizontal zoom window one here, and the same here. So we're looking, here is the top of the waveform, and here is the bottom of the waveform. You'll notice here a lot of steps. We have a times 10 magnification on. This is 8-bit. If I now change this into, into high resolution mode, watch what happens to the resolution, how good it becomes. So I go into my acquire menu. I go to high res, turn that on. I do an acquisition, and straight away, you can see the improvement in the resolution because of the high res capability. That's yeah. what high res is all about. And the unique thing that we have here is we're offering two zoom windows to enable the customer to look at both the top and the bottom of the, of the waveform simultaneously and get the full benefit of the resolution. And those stay there actually as you do a recapture. So if you've got a signal and you're making changes, you can keep on recapturing, you can zoom into two places at one time. Yep. As really long as helpful. your signal is in the right area for the zoom window and those sort of things, absolutely. Yeah. And interesting, we're talking about when we're talking about uh, resolution. We were talking before, um, so as soon as you start getting multiple channels turned onto a scope, you walk into basically any lab around there, you're going to see a four channel scope with one signal stacked on top of, top of the other, which means you're effectively losing vertical resolution. But and you're saying you've got quite a good way around that on some of your scopes, haven't you? We have. Now, that's an interesting point, point you raise. Um, so if we just come in now and we do a default on this oscilloscope, and I'll now go to auto setup. And you can see now we've got multiple channels on screen. If I move channel one and take that up the screen, channel two, reposition that, 
we'll say to let's say about there channel three we'll bring that down let's say about there and channel four bring that down this is the way a lot of people would drive um, a DSO so you've now got channel one two three and four down the screen etc there you're not getting the best resolution out of the instrument because what you're doing is you're digitizing with your 8-bit digitize across the full graticule so by limiting the top part of the screen to channel 1, you've actually limited the range of the ATD converter on channel 1. You've gone from 8 bits to, in this case, 6 bits. The way Yokogawa overcome that now is if we go to our display menu, I can come into format, and I can now go and select a number of different graticules. In this case, I'll select four. And now we have four independent graticules. You can see one, two, three, and four. And now if I come into, let's say, channel 3, I can now change my scaling factor and make that fit the graticule. I've actually gained two um, vertical ranges to improve the resolution. So now we're getting our eight bits across every single graticule. That way you're maintaining the signal integrity. You're getting the best out of your oscilloscope. And the other thing that's quite unusual about your oscilloscopes, with a lot of the um, oscilloscopes, particularly my um, day, day use oscilloscope is Nagellant, which advertises a banner of uh, four giga samples per second. But if you put all four channels on, that halves. With yours, and you've obviously got a very high number of channels, but it maintains the sample rate up to across all the channels, I believe. We have four independent ATD converters on the four channel scope, obviously yeah. two on the two channel scope, and likewise on the eight channel scope, we have eight uh, independent uh, ATD converters. So the sampling speed on all of these would be topping out at 1.25 giga samples per second. We then do have the capability to do what we call interleaving, where you take channel, the even number of channels and put them behind the odd number of channels, so then you put channel two behind channel one. Yeah. Doubles the record length, doubles the sampling speed. Excellent, that's a really flexible approach. Yeah. yeah. And that's got some really nice features in that scope then. There is just one other thing that would be interesting to show maybe. If I just yeah. do a default on this particular scope, and then I just go and do an auto setup. So again, we're looking at the cal signal. I change my sensitivity. I'll also just uh, change the display mode just for ease here. We'll go into um, pulse and we'll change the record length down to a short record length. So now we've got 1.25 kilo points uh, on screen. So I've basically I've changed the record length. I've changed the way we actually show the dots on screen a little bit. Now what I'm going to do is inject some faults. So now you, know, you see something flash through the screen, so I'm going to just break the signal here. We saw something flash through. We weren't quite certain what it was. We hit the stop button. Notice how this history light has come on. If I now press that button, you can see it's memorized all those faults that just flash through. We haven't done anything special to set the scope up. We've pulled up history mode. We can see individual waveforms. We could, for instance, go on now and just look at one waveform. We could search for them, they're time stamped. It's a very powerful facility. Standard within all our scopes. It's something we've always done this history mode. The key here is though, you don't have to turn it on. It's there running in the background all of the time. Absolutely, and it's not affecting the operation of the scope. You're not sitting there going, oh, do I turn it on or do I turn it off? Is that going to increase sample rate? It's just running there all it's the time. Running all the time, ready in for the background. You. The situation where you see something go through, you thought, what was that? Hit the stop button, go into history, you'll be able to go back we can go back up to 50,000 acquisitions automatically. And you can search through those the different criteria and pull out the waveform that you want. Once you pick the waveform out, then you could arrange to trigger it on a repetitive basis. Yeah. It's seeing it in the first place. And of course, you're talking about sort of searching, obviously searching through 50,000 waveforms is painful if you don't have a good search system. But when you were showing me some of the search options, one in particular was um, where you can just drag a box over, you can select a particular glitch if it's a glitch in a real system, and then it'll even give you the timestamp of when that happened. It will do. And that's phenomenally powerful. If we go back to our mode and we go back to where we had it before, which was all waveforms, yeah. we could at this point go to list, and now we get a list of all those events. So you could leave this over a period of days, logging away in principle, come back and see precisely when each event occurred. We could now come in. Um, I'm just going to deliberately, just to gain quickness in the demonstration, reduce the number of waveforms we're going to look over. So we'll just limit it to 1800 waveforms. If we now come in and do a search on channel one, condition, it's correct. And now we've got the box turned on. So now we can reposition that box using this control here. So let's suppose we wanted to pick out a particular waveform. So we do that and we then 
change our upper and lower to bring that down. So now we have a waveform that's entering into that box. If I now go and say execute that search, it will search through all those 1800 waveforms looking for the events that go within that box. There it's found it. You've isolated it. That's one of, in this case, 1800 waveforms it's pulled out. You could now come back and you could list how often has that occurred. In this case it's once, but it could be 10 times. And particularly, yeah, if you're looking for a glitch, quite often you don't know what the glitch is going to look like. So this memory can just capture a whole load of them, have a look through, see which one it's going to be, get all your triggers set up, then ready for next That's time. It. It's identifying the problem. Once you know what the problem is, you can then arrange to do a, a trigger, a repetitive trigger, and this sort of thing. But it's when you don't know what's going on, you see something flash through un unexpectedly. Hit the stop button, and we'll have caught up to 50,000 events and stored it automatically. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, thanks very much for your time. That's really interesting. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks.